The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahan. A tribal leader is asking the federal government to look into a Native American boarding school in Kansas. The Shawnee Indian Mission School was established as a manual training school for Indian children from the Osage, Cherokee, and many other tribes. Shawnee Tribal Chairman Ben Barnes believes the government may not look into the school because it was run by the Methodist Church and not the federal government. The school opened in 1839, but training there ended in 1854 before the mission closed in 1862. According to the Kansas Historical Society, nearly 200 indigenous children between ages 5 to 23 were forced to attend. The mission currently operates as a state historic site and is open to the public. And at another campus, students are demanding University of Minnesota Morris search for potential graves of students who attended the boarding school in the late 1800s. More than 4,000 people signed a student-led petition this month in support of a Morris campus search. The Morris boarding school was founded in 1887 by the Sisters of Mercy, one of such schools operated by the Catholic Church. Later, they turned it over to the federal government. It was closed in 1909 and the campus was transferred to the state of Minnesota. The transfer also included a stipulation that Native American students be granted free tuition to any ed educational institution that was built there. That policy remains in effect. Now, students say it's an essential step for the university to confront and heal from this history. Morris leaders say they do not shy away from their history and recently joined the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. But administrators have not committed to search as questions remain about where the graves are located and their existence. Research conducted in 2018 suggests children who died at the boarding school may have been buried on or near the present-day campus. Morris students and the faculty say they found no documentation that the children's remains were ever returned to their parents. And follow-up research did not find evidence that such graves existed, according to the university. As a result, Morris administrators are not certain a cemetery exists. In California, the American Indian Education Oversight Committee is finally meeting. The last meeting was held in 2017. The committee was created by the state and provides advice on American Indian education. Members of the group have extensive knowledge on current issues facing American Indian communities in California. The 24-member committee works on tribal consultation, cultural standards, reviewing curriculum, and resources and impacts from COVID-19. The California Department of Education funds 23 American Indian Education Centers and 12 American Indian Early Childhood Education Programs. Public schools in the state serve more than 25,000 American Indian students on a daily basis. On most reservations, you don't have to look too far to find res dogs. While at Fort Hall, the Shoshone Bannock Tribes Recreation Department started a res dog contest 15 years ago. The idea was to let people show off their res dogs. As Lori Edmo shows us, what started off as a fun summer event has evolved into a contest with five different categories and mutts competing with fancier dogs for the coveted top res dog prize. About 30 Fort Hall summer recreation participants, along with adults, brought their canine friends to the Fort Hall ball field to compete for the smallest, largest, smartest, cutest, and top res dog. The contest has been going on for 15 years, but was sidelined last year because of the pandemic. Participants appeared to be happy again to be on the field amid the barking and the struggle to hang on to their dogs. The res dog contest started probably 15, 
at least 15 years ago. And what, what it originally was is actual res dogs. The kids would, out, would go out and get res dogs and bring them to the contest. And it's not, it wasn't as big as it is today. We didn't, we didn't have all the categories in that time. Like now we have the biggest, the smallest, the cutest, and we have five different categories now. But at that time, there was just the res dog. There was one year when kids literally found a res dog on the way to the gym, and they just put a rope on it, and then the owner came looking for it, and they were like, oh, you can keep the stuff, but I'm, you know, my dog made it to the res dog contest without me because the kids around here just run the area. And it's nice to be back in here because COVID stopped it last year, so we're excited to have some dogs here. Paco, owned by Mitt and McClare, was named the top res dog. This is Paco, yeah. and he's 15 years old. He's a little Pomeranian, and we rescued him uh, from a, a truck that threw him out on Highline Road quite a few years ago when he was just little, and he's been ours ever since. In Fort Hall, Idaho. Lori Edmo, Indian Country Today. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Mark Trahant. Native women experience violence at higher rates than other women in the country. When we come back, we'll find out how tribal governments, cities, and community leaders are addressing this issue. Our guest is Paula Julian from the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. We'll be right back. There are only 58 domestic violence shelters in the country to serve 547 federally recognized tribes, according to the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Paula Julian is the Senior Policy Specialist for the National Indig Indigenous Women's Resource Center. She has more than 25 years experience working on violence against women issues, especially Native women. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for having me this morning. What's the biggest challenge that we face here? Um, I think the biggest challenge is uh, the federal government's failure to fulfill its trust responsibility to Indian tribes um, to assist them in safeguarding Native women. And that safeguard has multifaceted approach. It includes safety issues, law enforcement. Maybe talk about some of those roles. Sure. So um, just a few months ago, NIWRC released our six-point action plan um, that can be found in our current edition of our restoration magazine. And in that six-point action plan, uh, two of the points speak to the importance of the federal government restoring tribal authority, uh, recognizing uh, the sovereign authority of Indian tribes to protect um, their women. Um, as well as the need and the failure of the uh, federal government to fulfill its trust responsibility in providing for the necessary resources. So hence you have the fewer than 60 native women shelters across the country um, to serve all of the country's uh, federally recognized tribes. Um, and that's, you know, given the past, um, you know, combined 50 years of legis federal legislation specifically addressing violence against Native women, uh, we really have so much further to go. Uh, it's really sickening to think that there's fewer than 60 shelters across the country and, and even fewer um, sexual assault services for Native women, especially given the rates. 55% of Native women experience physical violence and 56 experience sexual violence. So, you know, it's, it's um, I think the importance of the reauthorization by the federal government of the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act and the Violence Against Women Act with the tribal enhancement, enhancements are so critical. Maybe start by examining just a bit more the importance of shelters. Uh, 60 is such an, un an undercount in terms of what's needed. What alternatives are there for women facing really an emergency situation? Um, well, very limited um, alternatives. So uh, they could access non-native services, um, primarily off tribal lands, but over and over what we see happening um, when they do that is 
they may go for crisis um, and emergency assistance, but beyond the immediate crisis, they will, um, you know, thankfully decline services or um, in some instances, the services, they'll time out of, of getting help from those non-native services. Um, and we know, you know, statistically, women, native and non-native, um, have to um, leave a situation multiple times in order to really get the support and assistance they need um, to fully um, escape from the violence. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, that's why it's so important that there are, um, you know, that we increase the options for women to be able to access services on tribal lands designed by and for Native women. Is there a model that you can think of that we should be telling Congress do more of this? Um, yes. Um, so I, I would say one model um, is what we've seen through the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, which is flexible funding for tribes to be able to de determine for themselves how to provide advocacy services to Native women. Um, so FIBSA is, um, has been federal law since 1984 and has funded overall general shelter and supportive services for victims of domestic violence. With that funding, tribes have been able to um, really use the funding in ways that will meet their needs. So if it's supporting actual shelters, which are again, few and far between, and part of that is um, the challenge with FIBSA is the limited funding stream. Um, but you know, they've been able to um, assist women, um, place them in safe homes, for example, in Alaska, volunteer safe homes, in different villages, um, but we know that, that that's insufficient, especially given uh, what we've seen happen with COVID um, and safety restrictions. So there've been, I think, the, a less usage of safe homes because of COVID, um, but we, you know, we've got two of the oldest Native women's shelters across the country, one um, on Rosebud, the White Buffalo Calf Women's Society, and two in the Imanic uh, village of Alaska, uh, the Imanic Women's Shelter. And those shelters, I think what has been, um, I guess what you could say, a, a model uh, for those two shelters has really been services designed by and for Native women. So when women walk through the door, you know, they provide them with the range of services and not just, you know, we can help you call the police, we can help you secure a protection order, but really asking women, what do they need? What do, what do they and their children need? And if it's time in a purification lodge or time um, in a steam, steam house, um, what, what you pick people will call makis, you know, that, that that's going to bring the women the support and healing that they need in order to help them um, make the best decisions for themselves and their families. Um, and if it's staying with, with those shelters or moving um, away from their homes into urban areas, um, temporarily, then, then they can do that, but they'll have that with the support of their Native sisters. I want to ask you how, uh, since um, we now have a track record with uh, the Violence Against Women Act, how has criminal justice reacted, and is it better now than it was, and is it an opportunity to get even better? Unfortunately, Mark, um, <laughs> so Unfortunately, as we've seen across the nation um, and the failures of the justice, particularly the Western justice system. So we saw this in the 70s and 80s um, where um, police officers just were not responding. Um, in many tribal communities, there's just not the officers to respond. So there's no law enforcement response, um, to, particularly to violence against native women. Um, but where even where there is a law enforcement response, um, especially when it's a non-tribal law enforcement response, if it's the federal or state and local response, um, the justice system just fails. Uh, it's the response is inadequate. Um, you know, they, um, there's still a lot of victim blaming. Um, if there is any alcohol or substance abuse involved, um, you know, she is blamed for that. 
um, Child Protective Services is called. Um, children are often removed. Um, and so for those reasons, women won't call law enforcement because they don't want um, the threat of having their children removed. Um, so there's so many barriers, I think, to this law enforcement response that we see across Indian country um, that to continue to push that when it's it's almost the same thing that we see from 35 years ago to today. So that's why we say when the justice system fails women, all they have are advocates, shelters, and those advocacy services. And when we have fewer than 60 of them in the entirety of Indian country, including Alaska, um, you know, there's no surprise to all of us that work with Indian tribes why there are the rates of missing and murdered. Um, there's not the support that the women need in the tribal communities. You mentioned funding for the resource centers. And even if you take the number in total, it's still relatively modest. Why is there opposition to this? Um, I think for, um, so for VAWA, for the Violence Against Women Act, uh, there's opposition around um, recognizing that tribes have the sovereign authority. Uh, to respond with their tribal justice systems, whatever that tribal justice system looks like, whether it looks like the Western system with law enforcement, you know, jails, prosecutors and courts, or whether it's an indigenous justice system. Um, and so there's that resistance to tribal authority. And then there's really that failure to provide the necessary resources that tribes need. Um, and I'm sorry, Mark, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I, if I forgot your question now. Well, basically, what are the resources we need to make some um, effort going forward? Yeah, so, so what we have seen, um, so that, that's in the Violence Against Women Act. In the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act and the Victims of Crime Act, what we have seen most recently, especially because of the tribal outcry and the... Um, our allies, our non-Native allies standing with us, calling for the increase in resources, particularly for tribes. What we've seen the past, I think, past five or six years is an increase in the resources for shelter and advocacy services. So particularly in the last five, six years, we have seen changes. Um, and that has been because Congress is beginning to understand more that while it's important to strengthen the justice system, that we can't fail the shelter, supportive services, and, uh, and sexual assault services needs. So we have seen a slow and gradual increase. Um, and that's a good thing. We need to continue to see that. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, unfortunately, um, the services that women need get really uh, less airtime than the, the reforms needed in the justice system. Um, so I worked for the federal government back in 1995 to help open the Violence Against Women Grants Office. And back then, um, the statement was, we don't, and this was, you know, sort of an unspoken word. Well, it's more, you know, the, the best way for me to describe it is it was more glamorous to really focus on the justice response versus, you know, talking about what women need, shelter, supportive services, support for their children. Um, there was more attention paid to that. Um, and I'm not sure if it had to do with the fact that the Violence Against Women Act um, is primarily a Department of Justice um, initiative. Um, but, you know, there has been slowly over the last five to 10 years, more attention paid to, you know, the justice system isn't the end-all end be-all solution um, for violence against women problems. We really need to look at how to prevent that. And part of how to prevent that is pr providing the support for women and children before the violence gets to, you know, uh, becoming homicide for them or their children. Before the violence. Thank you so much, Paula Julian. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, for having me on your show. When we come back, we'll catch up with Callie Benali, our reporter who's been covering burial mounds in Minnesota and the missing and murdered indigenous women movement.
The city of St. Paul, Minnesota is coming to terms with land that was turned into a park in 1892, but it's now recognized as a burial site for at least seven tribes. That's just one story Kelly Benali, Benali has reported on recently. She joins us today to tell us more about the Indian Mounds Park. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, thank you for having me. So start with this cultural landscape story uh, and tell us what that's about. Um, so the city of St. Paul has had a park in the city um, for decades and it's been just used for recreational use and it hasn't really up front acknowledge the cemetery for over seven tribes. And so they have now have more signage up and um, sidewalk installations and on light posts that recognize it as its original um, land as being a cemetery. How, how is the public being told about all of this? Is there an education process going on? Um, just if you go to the park, there hasn't really been announcement or anything. Um, just so if you walk through it, you see signs on light posts on the sidewalks um, and up front on the, the, the original signage, it just says you are in a cemetery where it says Indian Mounds Park. What about the public reaction? How has that been? Um, well, for a while, the community who lived near the park weren't that supportive of it because it's a very used park. There's trails and it's a popular place to view fireworks. And um, there's, I guess, a lot of memories um, that people have with their kids. Um, so, but the people who worked on the project uh, said that a lot of them did kind of turn around and now are accepting of it and understand it a little more. At ICT, as a reporter, you get thrown into lots of things. And lately, you've been on the Minnesota beat. Uh, tell us about uh, the Minnesota's new state office on missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, so the Minnesota Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Task Force that the uh, state assigned and supported, they finally now have a physical office that they now can come together and work on this issue. It's going to be in um, the St. Paul, Minnesota area. And yeah. I understand they have a new name for this office. Um, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives Office. So it's just to include the LGBTQIA community um, and two-spirit community. And just so to make it an open space to feel that everyone is involved in working on this issue. One of the challenges of this with a state agency is making sure the data can be shared. Do you know if they're taking any steps along those lines? Um, I think just continuing, continuing to be as transparent as possible. Um, they, Peggy Flanagan, Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota said that she hopes that it won't, the city limits won't um, limit the people, the tribes from coming and being a part of it and that they'll continue to outreach to many communities and tribes. How about the funding stream? Is it serious and effective in that sense? Um, yes, so for, it will be a million by biennium, so about 500,000 a year. And um, they're hoping to have um, at least three full-time staff. There's such a high rate of violence uh, and certainly Minnesota is part of this with uh, indigenous women. Uh, what are some of the steps they wanna take immediately? Immediate, I don't know about immediate steps. I just know that they're just continuing the issue and continuing to collect data um, and just addressing violence, I think in general, because violence is a huge contributing factor to missing and murdered indigenous women. Another story you've been thrown into, and I know with uh, the Olympics, it's kind of uh, seems like a long time ago, but there was an NBA finals and uh, you wrote about the indigenous involvement in that. Mm -hmm. um, well, for the Minna Milwaukee team, their um, arena floor was built by a tribe in um, Wisconsin. Was the Menominees of Wisconsin, yes. Yes, so that was a direct tribal um, influence, but 
just the there's a lot the sons had a lot of native fans and it was very prominent on social media and the sons also had two really um, high profile native uh, leaders one who was an assistant coach and also the director of entertainment for the sons which uh, brought a lot of tribal issues right to the floor mm -hmm. um yes don walker he wrote more extensively about the assistant coach um but, as far as I know, that's all. Okay, fair enough. What are you working on now, Kelly? Um, just, I recently worked on the Res Summit 2021 uh, Summit in uh, Las Vegas um, and just working on Native leaders and how they were very significant community leaders and then going into tribal politics. That was so extraordinary because that was really the first meeting where people came back together and now everyone's watching to see how safe everybody was. Mm -hmm. Callie Benali, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.